Hello. Is this happening? Is it for real? All right. Hi, I'm Greg Tito. Uh, this is uh, uh, the live recording, first live recording of Dragon Talk. Uh, we usually, we record uh, some of these with uh, with with Shelley. Uh, we'll do an intro bit with her uh, a little bit later on. But before that, uh, I usually get into the studio with these guys and do a live recording of uh, Lore You Should Know. Uh, so uh, we'll start that segment off right now, and uh, uh, it'll be it'll be just like uh, we're doing this for real. So it's it's kind of fun. Thank you so much for joining us. This is kind of going to be like a uh, uh, an experiment in process. So we'll be changing things up as we go along. Um, and, Probably uh, me. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, get you get out of here. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so we'll we'll do introduce this segment like we normally do, uh, and uh, and get right into it. And then maybe if there's some uh, really good questions that you guys might pop, we got the chat down here, um, and uh, I'll, maybe I'll try and integrate some of that with the with the show itself. And that's will end up in the uh, podcast episode that will come out uh, this Thursday. Sounds like a plan? All right, great. So, uh, welcome to a Lore You Should Know segment. Uh, and I am joined by these two wonderful people who you can see in the flesh for the first time. Uh, Mr. Chris Perkins. Howdy, everybody. First time you've seen him ever <laughs> in the world. And uh, Matt Cernet. Hello. He, this is the, the second time you've seen him in the world. These are our true forms. <laughs> you have evolved, finally. Excellent. Uh, so this Lore You Should Know segment, we talk about little bits of uh, Dungeons and Dragons lore, uh, talk about its uh, involvement with uh, the Forgotten Realms timeline, as well as just general tidbits that you can use in your own games. Uh, and today's topic is Aarakocra. Yes, yes. Aarakocra. They are the flying bird people of Dungeons and Dragons. When did uh, when did they first appear? In D and D, they first appeared in the first edition Fiend Folio. Fiend Folio, that is correct. Yeah. Yep. First monster in the Fiend Folio. Double A. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, make sure you get it in there first. It's that old advertising trick. <laughs> yeah. Get it in uh, at the top of the list. Yeah, f the frequently misspelled bird people, as, yes, uh, as yes. we referred to it. Uh, so uh, frequently misspelled. So I can see uh, going through my files, I was looking around, and it's spelled wrong in various printed products probably <laughs> at least a dozen times. But thankfully in 5th edition, not yet. <laughs> We've got like the extra gnomes looking at it to make sure that we uh, uh, we keep it. I have to re look it up every time. It's A A R A K O C R A. Yes. Yes. Correct. I nailed it. Uh, so they appeared in the Fiend Folio. What kind of what kind of monster were they? Well, uh, they are um, bird people. They they look a little different in the Fiend Folio than they do now in Fifth Edition, uh, in that they had sort of their. Um, hands at the bend of the wing, the sort of hinge of the wing, and mm. then they had the, the wing coming down on either side. And they actually look pretty fearsome. Right. Um, and they're described as, um, uh, I don't know, generally, I, I was looking at a description earlier this morning, generally pretty fearsome. But then in later editions, they became kind of just the... Yeah, we realized they couldn't <laughs> scratch themselves, so we had to... <laughs> <laughs> a, nice, a nice peaceful race or something. Yeah. So they kind of got... They kinda got to sort of fobbed off as this, uh, yeah. That those they're, they're they're good race, so they're they're just nice and and they're so they they were one of the good monsters. Uh, not originally, they not were, originally. They were really a neutral aligned. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. And it's interesting because they they uh, appear in a lot of different products over the 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 years and various adventures and um, they're in Spelljammer, they're in Dark Sun, mm -hmm. they're in Greyhawk, they're in Forgotten Realms. Uh, there are Dragonlance. I, Any world that has a double A. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you can't have a double A in your in your in your vocabulary, it right. just doesn't work. Um, yeah. So they're 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 all over the place. Um, I was I was looking into it this morning, and I found out that they have two gods. Two gods. Yeah. That the, created them. That well, one is one is listed there as, as the creator, and the other is uh, listed as their primary deity. But it basically it boils down to the fact that one was in a dragon article, and somebody forgot it was there, and they invented a new one. <laughs> and so they still have them both in theory, but we don't generally refer to either of them very much because uh, they just didn't gain a whole lot of traction. Were they, you mentioned they were mentioned in uh, uh, Adventures. What, uh, were there Adventures that you remember that specifically used them very well? Not or? very often. Um, there's a Dragonlance Adventure, I think it's like Dragons of Light or mm -hmm. something like that, um, where there's like a, a whole... Um, uh, plateau or something like that, where there's a bunch of Aarakocra you can interact with. Mm -hmm. I th I think there's, as far as I know, only two novels in which they're mentioned in 
one case it's a passing reference, and in another uh, it's a gnome illusionist pretending to be an Aarakocra very briefly. <laughs> uh, so that's funny. That's a, it's a it's D&D monster that I remember hearing so much about, but it doesn't seem to have like a... a, a yeah, they appeared once or twice in a couple of the UK series adventures, um, as a lot of Fiend Folio monsters did. Mm-hmm. Uh, if, you were, if you were a monster that was born in the Fiend Folio, the odds of you showing up in, in one of those early adventures was pretty slight, unless the adventure itself came out of the UK. Exactly. Makes sense. Yeah. Makes sense. And then how did they change over the editions? Did uh, uh, second edition make a, a, a big shift? I, I wouldn't say so. I think, mo- I mean, a lot of times what happened with, with first and second edition is uh, things stayed pretty stable. Um, a lot of uh, sort of details about like height and weight and things like that were often nailed down in second edition. You right. know, really needed to know that an elephant weighed this much and then an Eric Coker weighed this much. The hollow um, bones. Yeah, so that kind of a thing. But uh, it wasn't really, I don't think, until fifth that we started to change things a little bit. Yeah, we started to introduce some lore in second um, with things like the Wind Dukes and mm. uh, some Planescape material. And Eric Coker got swept up <laughs> in... <laughs> In that, in the tornado yeah. of so uh, a lot, of, a lot of a lot of that lore was then picked up and kind of added to the Aarakocra later to say, and and really wasn't codified until late yeah. that Aarakocra are beings with elemental ties mm. to to air specifically. I yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. And in in second edition and Planescape and that kind of thing, uh, they're very much just tied to the the air planes and, and in Spelljammer, whenever there's a sort of airy world. Uh, there's always Aarakocra there in the airy world, which, by the way, I have to correct myself. There was not, in a previous podcast, as I mentioned, a world in which there was Tarasks that ate giant gold beetles. There's two separate worlds, one with Tarasks and one with giant gold beetles. Never the twain shall meet. So I can apologize for... <laughs> <laughs> That's important. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Very different. Very different worlds. <laughs> nice. So the uh, so the, how, how were the Aarakocra related to the, the Wind Dukes of Aqua when, when that was well, happening? Well, th- everything's got the double A. Yeah. <laughs> yes. A-A-Q-A. I say Aqua, but it's Aka. Aka, yeah. Aka. Aka. Uh, and, and there's also the Vati, and that has two A's in it. Yes. Well, right? uh, D-A-A-T-I. So, yeah. So, that, so you can't fly with feathers <laughs> unless you've got double A's. Remember that. <laughs> And uh, then, so like the, there's this sort of story with the Rod of Seven Parts, where the Rod of Seven Parts is one of these um, uh, artifacts in the first edition D&D and so on, and doesn't have much description. And second edition has a description that it mentions the Wind Duke Savaka and... That came up in the big box set, the Rod of Seven, named right. the Rod of Seven Parts. Right. And that d- developed with Skip Williams and turned into a giant super adventure with all of that kind of information in there and uh, Miska the, wor- the Wolf Spider and uh, yeah. Queen of Chaos and so on. And that was uh, picked up again in third edition in bits and pieces. It's been one of those bits of lore that rattles around that isn't doesn't get a lot of focus, but every now and then people kind of dip in and, yeah. you know, kind of put their own little twist on and it. And I remember the, the Age of Worms campaign was where uh, that was first introduced to me, all that yep. that lore about the, those, 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 that ancient battle on the, on the Wind Dukes. Uh, right. Uh, and so, yeah, no, it's interesting that a lot of people, that their touchstones, you're right, like they, they hear about it and then it's something that has ripples yeah. throughout all of the D&D lore. So since the Wind Dukes were instrumental in the creation of the Rod of Seven Parts as this instrument with which to defeat Mishka the Wolf Spider mm-hmm. and her demonic legions, uh, it later just sort of became embedded in the Aarakocra lore that it, it could be that Aarakocra communities have fragments of the rod and that they're guarding them from other beings who would try to assemble the rod and use it for ill. Um, so that's kind of one of the hooks we toy with in 5th edition that, yeah, you can sort of bring the rod of seven parts into your uh, modern campaign and use the Aarakocra as sort of uh, window dressing right. for that story. Right. Yeah. And in the uh, Forgotten Realms in the north, there's an area of uh, the a, a large settlement of Aarakocra in sort of the high forest area. And even way back when in the second edition materials, uh, they're, they're associated with the star mounts. And the star mounts are these mountains with these giant crystals on them and so on in the middle of the high forest. And there's this fierce wind up there that only the Aarakocra can fly through, basically, mm. unless they're unless you're like a super huge dragon. Nothing else can fly through besides the Aarakocra. So there's even there that element and, and that tie to the element of wind and air and that kind of a thing. That so. makes sense. Now and they do also show up in other places of the world, including Chult. Yeah. 
Yes. Um, pretty much you can find Aarakocra or wherever there are mountain Aries and other high roosts. Um, but yes, in Tomb of Annihilation, they show up uh, quite prominently as, as being one of the kind of major intelligent species that have inhabited Chelt. And they live on the mountaintops. And uh, there is a particular location in Tomb of Annihilation that's described in detail, which is the monastery of Kir Sabal, which clings to the side of a plateau. And mm-hmm. the Arakokar have taken it over and turned it into a nest. And uh, what, how does their, uh, uh, at least you know, even in, in Schultz, how does their um, society get formed? Like, they, is it clannish? Is it family-based? Like, what, what is it? It's generally small sort of tribal groups. Yeah. Um, like little congregations. It, yeah. There's, I, I think it's in, I'm pretty sure, it's in the Forgotten Realms, um, realm space that sort of spell jammer with all the different worlds. Right, and so. which we talked about in the yeah. course I mean, a couple I'm, weeks ago. One of those worlds is has a bunch of lizard folk in a sort of a giant civilized, you know, planet basically taking the role of humans. And then Aarakocra being kind of like the role of orcs almost in that world where they're sort of this tribal force that's antagonistic towards the lizard folk. And I so see. On. So, right. Yeah, they're always sort of a tribal force. And, 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 uh, and so I always imagine um, a, a – they, they don't – they say that they don't have sort of a sense of uh, possessions and that kind of a thing. So I think of a, a, of a society that's um, uh, very ephemeral. You know, they don't really write things down, I don't think. It's probably just their, their hands are storytelling. Well, dexterous. Well, I mean, in fourth, fifth edition, we give them, we give them hands. Okay, okay, they have actual hands. Right. Okay, good. Yeah. But they're not like making paper and ink and all that kind of stuff. They're not craftsmen. No, they, they, they don't. Oral tradition, yeah. and, you know. Um, and so, yeah, if you're, if you're fortunate, uh, you can make friends with the Aarakocra in Tomb of Annihilation, and they can help you complete your quest. And in, in the tomb story, they've got a very specific role, uh, at least the Aarakocra of Kir Sabaldu, and that is they're protecting something. Mm. And you can find out what it is they're protecting and why. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, and uh, I like that they're always at the, you know, above... You know, uh, uh, living in mountains and plateaus, you know, yeah. so in, in Schultz especially, that'll be uh, super helpful so that they avoid all the dangers of below the tree line. Well, that's just it. If, if you want to avoid the worst in Chult, you could do worse than find a friend who can fly. That's true. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of which, I mean, is there, I, I know there's a lot of people who would love to, to play as an Aarakocra uh, player character. What, uh, what kind of advice would you give to, to those kind of players or the DM who has Pick to deal with the them? Volo's Guide to Monsters. Yes. Yes. That's yep. all I have to say about that. <laughs> 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 Therein you will find uh, information on playing Aarakocra as a player race. Nice. Is it, uh, uh, you know, I guess be, having to be a, the ability to fly changes up the, the, the dynamic at the table for sure. It does. It, it means also that the DM is going to have to throw more pteranodons at the party. <laughs> <laughs> Keep the Eric Coker character on us. That's good. Uh, so the, the deities that you mentioned, just going back to them, uh, are they, uh, you know, it sounds like they're a little bit more of a, uh, a pious uh, race. Uh, I don't know if I'm putting that on them, but... You know, it's, it's, what, what kind of uh, values do they, do they uh, adhere to? I mean, I would, I would say that they, they, they might be some spiritual or something, uh, but uh, the, the deities that are mentioned in, in the lore are, the first one was in Dragon Magazine, and that was Kro-Ka. Kro-Ka. <laughs> and guess which letters that uses. Uh, <laughs> so, and uh, has a double A. Um, and then the other one was uh, Cyranita, which is um, the one from Monster Mythology, and that one actually has uh, a lot more references in the lore later on. It continues on to be referenced in um, Planescape and that kind of a thing. Uh, they are not particularly interesting. Cyranita just is really nice. Uh, Cyranita is a member of the... Uh, there's a weird sort of organization of sky and and sea deities uh, that has a funny name, and I don't remember what it is now. Uh, let me see if I can find it before. Right, right. But there do, it is. are they, okay, go ahead. It's the Asathal Hafnere. <laughs> Hot. 
David Hasselhoff <laughs> Okay, so it's a terrible name. But <laughs> um, but the the interesting part about that is is that written into this little bit of lore that I find fun in monster mythology is that that's a contraction of a much larger elven term, meaning those who have their being in the sea haunted by the true dream, Ooh. which is just sort of nice and poetic. You know, it's, yeah. it's like an interesting little thing there. Like, Evocative. Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. So, uh, but the the Asaf, uh, uh, um, you know, is there's a bunch of different deities that are I- involved in that, and um, apparently they all it hang will out. Forever now be known as the Hasselhoff, <laughs> the Hasselhoff pantheon. <laughs> they, they all hang out in the upper plains and That's swim two in A's and Hasselhoff. Of course, and, right. Hasselhoff, Hasselhoff, <laughs> large hairy chests, leather jackets. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I can see them having the need for speed. Uh, yes. Uh, so, yeah, if you want to uh, play as an Aarakocra uh, Top Gun enthusiast, I think you can. Yes. <laughs> yes. Ride the highway to the danger zone. Awesome. <laughs> oh, my. Anything else on uh, Aarakocra we want to uh, leave uh, our wonderful listeners? Hey, and anybody at home, if you have any uh, uh, questions, feel free to pop it into chat real quick, and I'll see if I can get it answered. If it's a good question. It has to be good. Awkward silence. Awkward silence must happen as I try to read fast. It's a work in progress here, up. folks. What's that? They also have to catch up. They also have to catch up. That's right. That's true. Good to know. And the good thing is that Ryan will have to edit all this out when we actually do it for the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ryan. Very good stuff. Uh, let's see. In fourteen or 418 DR, apparently, that is when the Aarakocra arrive from the Mastika um, continent in Forgotten Realms. They came from Mastika? Yes. Oh, okay. So, because remember, uh, with creator races, there's the Aeri, right. who, who are ancestors slash creators of the Aarakocra in the Forgotten Realms. Um, and they kind of just went off onto that continent over there. And so, in theory, they come back as Aarakocra. In, r- r- timeline-wise, r- roughly a thousand years ago for realms. Got it. Every thousand years is the great Aarakocra migration. <laughs> <laughs> and they tried, they're like, yeah, there's the uh, uh, Richard like Attenborough narrated, narrated yeah. documentary to make it all happen. Uh, but apparently, I think I think they were in the you know, element, Elemental Evil Player's Companion is where the Aarakocra as a player race were uh, uh, listed. Is that? They, yes. yes. They are there. Yes. Yep. So thank you, Chad, for pointing that out to us. Uh, 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 what's in our own books? It always helps. Thank you for that. Uh, so, um, all right, cool. Well, I guess that's uh, all I got for for uh, uh, more interesting news. All right, uh, yeah. All right. Well, we'll cut it all that part out, and we'll end up going with. Uh, 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 thank you guys so much for uh, talking about Eric Coker with me. Uh, we'll be doing more lore. You should know with these live over the next uh, few months as we get to Tomb of Annihilation. And uh, yeah, I guess that's it. Yeah, we'll get better probably. <laughs> no, we'll get worse. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, all right, so we're going to uh, – that's, that's, that's the end of that segment as far as the audio goes, but we're still here for video, and we'll uh, uh, do a little reset. We start to talk about the next segment topic, uh, which will be – so get your questions ready for this one. This is about dinosaurs in Dungeons & Dragons kind of in general, uh, as well as more specifically as what's going on in Chult. Uh, if you guys li- watched the stream of Annihilation, uh, not this past weekend, but the weekend before, it feels like it was just – very recently, but it was it was almost uh, uh, a week and a half ago now at this point um, that we announced uh, Tomb of Annihilation and uh, dinosaurs feature heavily in in that uh, as well as undead zombie dinosaurs as Chris uh, uh, famously threw out there uh, when we were talking about the story to open up. So if you guys have any questions about dinosaurs, feel free to throw them out there now into the chat, and I'll try to find them if I can. It's hard to read a lot uh, and talk at the same yes. time. And when we're talking about dinosaurs, we're kind of talking about not just dinosaurs, but a broader group of creatures that includes dinosaur-like critters. Like, technically, Dimetrodons aren't dinosaurs, but mm. we kind of lump them in. Yeah. I thought you were going to go with, like, the muck dweller. The muck <laughs> dweller, <laughs> also not a real dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> it is funny, though. I mean, yeah, we do talk about, like, use, like, actual real names for dinosaurs interchangeably with things yeah. that are not. But Matt brings up an interesting point, and that is we've had dinosaurs that of creatures that just look like dinosaurs that have non-dinosaur names and were never real dinosaurs of any kind. Right. Yes. And dino- the dino- name dinosaur itself means terrible lizard. Is that what it is in, mm-hmm. in, uh, in the Roman Latin derivation? Yes. So technically, 
you know, the one that you mentioned is still a terrible lizard. Yes. yes. <laughs> the muck dweller, yeah. Definitely. Yes, the muck dweller. Not, not such a terrible lizard because the muck dweller is like, what, two feet tall? <laughs> yeah, he's pretty small, yeah. <laughs> nice. Oh, my gosh. All right. Dweller. Are you good for, for that segment? Yeah, one second. Cool, and then we'll do another one uh, starting s- as soon as you tell me. All right. Welcome to Lore You Should Know. Uh, I am Greg Tito, and I'm joined by these two uh, wonderful gentlemen. I have got Chris Perkins over Hello. here. Hello. And Matt Cernit. Hi. And today we're going to talk about dinosaurs, Every f- the favorite topic of eight-year-olds everywhere. Uh, and As pertains to D&D. As pertains to D&D. Oh, no, I thought we were yes. just going to talk about dinosaurs. No, we're going to talk about D&D dinosaurs, uh, mm-hmm. as well as the dinosaur people, dinosaur-like peoples, uh, sorials, and uh, terra folk. Yep. Uh, which feature uh, in our new storyline that's coming out in September, Tomb Absolutely. of Annihilation. Love them or hate them, dinosaurs have been part of the game since the very, very beginning. That's true. Well, I'm really close to the beginning. Well, Monster Manual, <laughs> Monster, and d yes. is where they showed up. That's they, pretty darn close. They, they didn't show up in the Chainmail box set or no. the first original box set. We leave it to you to, to get these details <laughs> for us. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so what, were th- what, was, what did it look like in the Monster Manual? Uh, for AD&D. Uh, there was a section in the AD&D Monster Manual called Dinosaurs, and grouped in there were a bunch of stats for a bunch of real-world reptiles um, from from various prehistoric ages. And uh, uh, did they, they ranged from, like, the plant eaters that were huge mm-hmm. to the more yep. Tyrannosaurus Rex yep. meat eaters. Mm-hmm. And then later books in the uh, first edition, like the Monster Manual 2, included new ones. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think the Fiend Folio had a dinosaur section per se, but they did have some dinosaur-like monsters like the Bone Snapper. Mm. Um, and then the Monster Manual 2 also had some dinosaur-like monsters like the Muck Dweller. <laughs> <laughs> now, do we know if that was... Uh, you know, influenced by the, you know, all the, the academics that was happening about dinosaurs at the time. I'm pretty sure what happened was somebody, probably Gary, worked on D&D, had a bunch of little plastic dinosaur miniatures <laughs> and decided he wanted to use them in his game. And so he needed stats for them. That's, so many D&D monsters that's probably true. Uh, <laughs> came out of that. Yeah. Uh, so what was uh, on the table yeah, at the time. Exactly. And, all right, yeah. we need stats. Stat. Yeah, we don't have miniatures yet, but we do have little plastic dinosaur figures, so hell, hell yes. Nice. Yeah. That's very cool. And they ended up in a bunch of adventures and products mm-hmm. and so on over time. I mean, they, they basically don't ever stop being in D&D. I mean, they're in, in a ton of different adventures from every edition. Um, f- uh, well, with the weird sort of exception of fourth edition where... We stopped calling them dinosaurs yes. for some reason. Yeah, <laughs> well, we, just, we decided that uh, the worlds of D&D didn't have dinosaurs. They had behemoths. Oh, so that was just a word that we could so copyright in a way? or In or a way, it was a kind of like a an ownership thing or a sort of a, a brand identity thing right. to, to say, you know, we don't just want to just imitate all the real world earth creatures. We want our dinosaurs to be something special um, and have special in-world names. Right, right. And you could also say, like, the, you know, the evolution of the Forgotten Realms or Greyhawk or whatever thing would be, why would dinosaurs exist yeah. because of the history that's there? Yes. Well, yeah, I think some of the logic was, you know, why would you call, um, why would anyone in the world of Greyhawk Forgotten Realms, you know, call that a Tyrannosaurus Rex, right? Well, right. You know, and then it's like, well, why would they call that a unicorn, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's why would they call like, it a sword? <laughs> yeah. 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 So it's, it, at a certain point, that logic kind of fell apart. But um, they're, but it, they're back again in 5th edition and uh, certainly back As in the As dinosaurs and not behemoths. Yeah. yeah. There are behemoth dinosaurs. That makes sense. Uh, so yeah, right. You mentioned Chult specifically. So what uh, uh, what's what's going on with them there? Why are they are dinosaurs only in in Chult in the Forgotten Realms, or are they in other places no, too? No, they, they're in other places as well. Okay. Um, they're uh, places that come to mind are Lizard Marsh, which is on the coast of the the Sword Coast, which is sort of sort of south of Waterdeep. Uh, there's some, I think, also north of Waterdeep, Mirror of Dead Men. And then there's the Thunder Beasts that are basically brontosauruses that are up um, in sort of the cold north. The Evermores um, area? North or, that, okay. Uh, the, whatever the forest is up there, I'm forgetting that. Uh, and then also on the other side of the entire continent, uh, there's um, Malta. Malta? Not Malta. It's the Maltese <laughs> Falcon? 
Oh, it's an RPGA um, campaign that was set in a jungle, mm-hmm. and uh, and I want to say multiple, but that's not correct. Um, and that had a whole bunch of dinosaurs in it as well. But basically, any place that there were, you know, there was jungle, somebody decided there could be dinosaurs because people didn't know enough about the ecology of dinosaurs. <laughs> they like could also be in man. deserts and forests and, and you know, tundra <laughs> and whatever. <Yeah. laughs> Di- jungle, dinosaur, got it. All right, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. All um, right, so they're all over the world. So pe- so, so people in Waterdeep or, or, or Baldur's Gate or just, you know, peasants uh, know what they are and might have even had relatively ex- experienced them. I mean, so it's one of those things. So, like, uh, if you look at the real world and something like elephants, um, you know, uh, Caesar, I think, took elephants to to England to mm-hmm. try and you know conquer the whatever the primitive Brits were there at that time, uh, and uh, they died. Um, <laughs> it didn't work out. But you know, the elephants died. Yeah, the, the elephants. Not died. the Celts that he was trying to kill. Them. Yeah. Um, but y- you know, so so like people would see these things, but then they'd not see them again, and you know, for ages and ages and ages, and everybody would forget about them, and so on and so forth. So I think it's the same thing in the front realms, where, you know, y- you know, somebody might hear about certain monsters because they're sort of uh, stories that you tell one another. Like we tell one another stories about dragons and unicorns and all this kind of thing. They tell yeah. even more about things like displacer beasts and mimics and all those kinds of things. I'm not sure dinosaurs reach that level of threat that you'd write a whole lot of stories about um, but then maybe they'd mention oh they have these, this place in Chalt with the giant lizards oh that's interesting and then that's about all and I guess the, the real defining feature is that they're not dragons they're giant lizards that don't breathe anything right uh, they're, they're basically mundane they don't, they're not magical creatures yeah so in some ways you know people in the fantasy realm might be like oh they're they're fine not, yeah. you know, not yeah. so hard to yeah. deal with yeah, this yeah they're unintelligent you yeah. know beasts mm-hmm. in a way it's not like it's an owlbear Come on. Yeah, right. Like, that's amazing. <laughs> An owl bear. That's crazy. Uh, all right. So uh, back to Chult. So what does what's going on there with the dinosaurs? Why is there a concentration of them? There's there? a large concentration of them. Yeah. Uh, it it's like one of the most dinosaur heavy areas because it's mostly undeveloped, uh, un untamed frontier. And so, yeah, there's dinosaurs of every kind, all sizes, flying ones, big ones, little ones. And they've pretty much got free reign down there because there's no civilizations really encroaching upon their territory. Right. Uh, now, they do it in, in Chult currently in 5th edition. Uh, there is a growing undead menace that's sort of spreading through the jungle like a plague. And mm. that's having an effect on the dinosaur population. Uh, they might the dinosaurs might be gleefully feasting on zombies <laughs> and ghouls, or they might be killed themselves and animated by uh, ill magic and become undead dinosaurs. Mm. So when you go into Chult, there's a mixture of live dinosaurs, dead dinosaurs, and undead dinosaurs, all um, um, everywhere you, everywhere you can think of to go. And we had mentioned in an earlier lore that Uptow, uh, one of the gods of, of Chult, uh, sometimes appears as a dinosaur, and the dinosaurs are known as Uptow's children. children. That's yes. correct, yes. yes. In, in some parts of the lore he's referenced as creating them. I'm not sure if that's true or not, because um, it's one of the things where I, I think uh, it, it's timey-wimey. I mean, the storylines d- are different depending upon which edition they're written in, yeah. who wrote them, and that kind of thing. But yeah, I'm happy to say that sort of there's allegories and other things and legends surrounding him creating them, but whether it's true or not is not terribly important. Interesting. You know, but you might see a mural on a wall where Uptow's sitting on a dinosaur egg, and you're going, hmm, what's that about? <laughs> 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 that makes sense. <laughs> I made him, see? There's a mural that's, that proves it. <laughs> I totally didn't make that mural, though. Somebody believed it, yeah. and so it must be true. <laughs> <That's> exactly. <laughs> Uh, so, so uh, in Chultum, uh, are there uh, smaller dinosaurs, mm-hmm. or are they larger ones, or are they? They're all literally all sizes. Now, some of them um, are of a size and temperament that they can theoretically be domesticated, and trained, and put to task in a place like Port Nyanzaru, the big city on the coast, where a number of dinosaurs are used, like to pull cargo out of water mm. and to uh, carry stuff around or drag heavy things, and there's the the 
Port Nyons are custom of uh, racing dinosaurs. Okay, thank you. I was gonna, like, why isn't he talking about dinosaur races? <laughs> races <laughs> yes. Like, come on. Uh, and so that's kind of a big deal down there uh, to the extent that it's a it's a real it's a real show. I mean, they paint up the dinosaurs, oh, with racing okay. stripes on them. You know, brand marketing on the you know all that. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's they, ampersands all exactly. over the dinosaurs. Then they, then they race them through the streets, and everybody has a good time. Uh, and occasionally, somebody gets stepped on, and then you know, whatever. Nice. Um, but Do they follow it like uh, like it's NASCAR? Is it like that level of like mm-hmm. you know yeah, having pretty teams? Rabid. It's and pretty rabid uh, because they have to take their mind on the dangers that they face. Because right outside the walls of the city are terrors unimaginable, oh, okay. and so they need these distractions to uh, keep them happy. And uh, so the dinosaur race is very popular, and you can become very popular and very rich if you're a particularly good dinosaur racer and you have a reliable dinosaur who's good on its feet. Mm-hmm. Um, and Do, the, are there, are there uh, jockeys on the mm-hmm. dinosaurs? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes, it, they're ridden okay. dinosaurs. So, uh, so a, a dinosaur well, and rider. So I feel like a dinosaur rider is like a, uh, would be like a, a celebrity in, in Port yes. Nianzara. Yeah, it can be. Yeah, if they're good. Nice. Yeah. That's a cool little character and, idea and, for your bard. And dinosaurs, the dinosaurs can have weird names. It's just like, you know, going to the Kentucky Derby. They all have their names and IDs and people bet on them. And a lot of people lose money and a lot of people don't. Nice. Yeah. Who, uh, and it's the, is it the merchant princes that run the dinosaur races? Uh, not directly. Merchant princes are more involved in the trade of the city. Uh, mm-hmm. The dinosaur races are sort of put on by the city at large. Um, and anybody who has a dinosaur who's, you know, the dinosaurs trained and not just the eating people uh, <laughs> can theoretically participate in this race. Nice. Uh, and you mentioned them as being like beasts of burden too. Like mm-hmm. that is, yes. are they, are they, are they well suited to that? Uh, they can be. Uh, sometimes it helps to be, have an ankylosaurus uh, to carry around your stuff because it can carry a heck of a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, is assuming that it's, it was sort of raised and trained from birth. Now uh, there, there is a merchant prince in the city. His name is Ifan Talroa and he, he has monopolized the sale of dinosaurs. So if you oh. want to buy a dinosaur, you have to do it through him or one of his designated merchant subordinates. And does he breed them as well? Yes. Oh, okay. So if you're out in the jungles of Chult and you happen to find, say, an Allosaurus egg, mm. unguarded because mommy's off somewhere or daddy got killed by ghouls, uh, you can take that egg back to Port Nianzaro and sell it to merchant prince Ifan Talroa for a generous price. Nice. Yeah, that's good to know. I'm betting if they find an egg, they aren't going to know what it is. <laughs> right. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> we got an egg. <laughs> it's got it's got Ankylosaurus written on the the, the cut to scene of egg, egg over campfire. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, we fried it. Yeah. Uh, so uh, here's a question from uh, from chat: Are the Velociraptors uh, are they uh, you know Jurassic Park style uh, Velociraptors or they're more realistic Velociraptors? Okay. Because the Jurassic, uh, if people didn't know the 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 ones in Jurassic Park are uh, are actually closer to I don't know Deinonychus or some other thing or whatever, but it just didn't sound as cool as Velociraptor, because Velociraptors were actually basically the size of a turkey. Uh, so uh, the ones in the I think they're in the Monster Manual, aren't they? Velociraptors are in the Volo Sky. Oh no, 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 no. Oh yes, yes they One are. One or the other. Yeah. Anyways, they're in fifth edition. Yes. And they're the turkey sized ones. They're yes. the turkey ones. Yes. There is a dinosaur section in Volos Guide now that I remember, and Velociraptors are in there. Got it. All right. So they're they're the more realistic style, and then if you wanted the one that's the bigger, it's yeah. would have to be the Dinonychus Dinonychus is Dinonychus. probably the closest. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And those exist in Chult yeah. as well. And yes. And are, are they just as vicious? Are they just as you know, oh, they're, they're they're pretty vicious. Packs? Yeah. 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 Interesting. Okay, cool. Um, and uh, so we haven't mentioned really the well, you know. I've, let me see if there's a couple questions on on more dinosaur type things before I switch. Oh, my chat is not working. It's like making it go down. So the the one of the one of the new dinosaurs, quasi dinosaurs that's in Tomb of Annihilation is the undead Tyrannosaurus Rex, mm. and uh, we had or the Tyrannosaurus Rex zombie. And what we decided to do with him was to give him basically uh, a weird zombie drop ability that is to say that uh at, when you're fighting him he's basically got a gullet full of zombies that he's swallowed and he can <laughs> basically cause those things to spit up and attack you nice um, yeah it's pretty nasty um uh this is a good question from chat do the dinosaurs have uh feathers are they featherless or are they uh you know only scales yes and no um yeah i think it depends obviously on on type um, yeah. mm. so you know, I think the uh, things more like a uh, um, uh, Velociraptor and so on are more sort of bird-like and have more feathers and so have on. More. versus like an Ankylosaurus. Yeah. We don't really imagine that having a whole lot of feathers. Right. There's so if they're like proto-birds yeah, in a exactly. way, then they would have um, more. In, I, think it's, I think it's 
odd to see feathered ones. I think that's that's sort of extraordinary. Um, uh, now there is a dinosaur in Tomb of Annihilation that is a feathered dinosaur, and he's a special special bird. That guy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, so here's a here's another question from chat, and it goes right into our, our the next phase of this this segment, which is uh, is there a uh, player race uh, or a race uh, that's that's like the Dragonborn but more dinosaur like? Well, there are a couple. Dun, dun, ish. Dun. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, second edition and uh, the the novel, the Curse of the Azure Bonds, gave us a character, Dragonbait, and Dragonbait is not a lizard man, as nope. it was the the case and or or as he sort of appeared maybe sort of like a lizard man on the cover of the novel it was very clear that he wasn't and he it was a very strange character who is this sort of otherworldly paladin uh who communicated through scent and instead of talking because he was mute mm. and it turned out through that novel and uh its subsequent sequels that uh there's a race of these creatures uh, and they're called sorials and they are from another world and they have uh, their own little valley somewhere near Cormier where most of them are at I think and I think there's four different types like horn there's the fin heads fin heads horn heads mm. You started listening. Fine it. back. So, the, yeah. Yeah, some, something like that. And, and they're different sizes. No, they're, like, they're, okay. Yeah. Is it like a caste system where the mm, bigger ones are? They have different roles, I think, mm -hmm. in society. So okay. like, like the, the Triceratops ones, I think they're the biggest. They're sort of yeah. almost ogre-sized. Um, and, and then they have varying sort of sizes and stuff like that. And then the other one is that there are the Terra Folk in uh -huh. Chult. Well, uh, well, let, let's uh, talk about the serial just for a second there. Now, th they, they were mentioning this one character. Have, there, have we developed it more beyond that? Do we know what other world they came from? Was it when Abir and Toril were, uh, uh, or is this actually a realm space uh, 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 other world coming from other, other actual world worlds? It's really unclear what the world is that they come from. Um, mm -hmm. From from the the novels and the I mean, subsequent sort of role-playing game products that mention them and that kind of thing never really clarify where they come from or or anything like that okay uh, they but have they have their own world though their own deities their uh, and that kind of thing when they come to this world they uh, they actually sort of adopt the deities of this world so it seems like maybe somehow they got left their deities behind mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, they're and they're each one of the four types uh, is like a dinosaur ish. I mean, you said the mm -hmm. tri Triceratops. Yeah, one, they're so. humanoid dinosaurs with kind of like a particular dinosaur feel to them. Like there's the Triceratops looking ones, and then there's the ones who look like dragon bait who are got the the head crest. Oh, okay, right. Um, yeah, there's. Let's see, what is it? It's the fin heads, th which is the um, which is what's what dragon bait is. Mm -hmm. uh, the horn heads, which is the triceratops looking ones, the flyers, and the blade backs. I'm not quite sure what the blade backs are. Oh, maybe like a, a, a stegosaurus. St stegosaurus. Might be. Yeah. With, the, with the big, yeah. large plates in the back and a big tail with spikes on it. Uh, interesting. Yeah. Okay, so then, so that there, there's like a little pocket of the sorials and, and uh, what they are. And we can. Yeah, and you can say that there are pockets of sorials on any D&D world. Uh, they're, they're eminently importable right. in that way. Um, and uh, uh, do they show up in, in Tomb of Annihilation at all? Uh, it's funny you should mention it. Uh, one Sauriel shows up in Tomb of Annihilation. Mm, okay. In a in sort of a, a mysterious role. Interesting. All right, cool. Let's yep. keep that. We'll keep that a mystery for now. Dun, dun, dun. But Terra Folk. Yes. The other sort of dinosaur riff species uh, that is indigenous to Chult. Yes. Has been around since the Jungles of Chult source book. Correct. For first edition, um, and. They are, or they were originally shapeshifters oh. who could shift form between pterodactyl and humanoid. Humanish. Humanish. Yeah, yeah it, w it was interesting because they, they were, they would basically shift from basically a, a terra folk without any wings to a terra folk with, with wings, wings that could fly to, a to just a pteranodon. Oh, okay. Right. Uh, and then. 
So it begs the question, why would they ever want to be in the non-flying form? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was very strange. Yeah. Like, <laughs> well, yeah, and then why, why? It's like a vampire-esque type thing, yeah. too. Where it's like, like, why would you turn into, like, the small, smaller dinosaur just so you can look like another dinosaur? <laughs> disguise? That's important. So you could blend yeah. with other pteranodons? Yeah. Go to pteranodon... And, Meetings? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you blend. You blend yeah. in pretty good, Bob. But I mean, we know like, you're really like, a terrifying. These are like nine feet tall, eight feet yeah, tall. Yeah, they're big. Like, they're big. They're really, really big. Yeah, these and, aren't man sized creatures. And they're, yeah. and like, they they basically are, are just these uh, rapacious scavengers and they, they come down and attack people and steal all their stuff and kill them and fly off and so on. Yeah, so, interesting. So, it, it never really made sense to for me that that they had the three different forms because I mean I guess maybe the wings would get in the way so you'd, I don't know I don't know why they is it is it a way and this is a question from chat like is it a way to get like were dinosaurs in there somehow no they they weren't were dinosaurs I mean there have been a lot of were everything in D and D yeah uh, but uh, I don't think we've ever had. I'm not going to say we haven't ever had wear dinosaurs because <laughs> God someone knows, will find it. Some, uh, yeah, it's probably out there. I'll have someone to look. make it right now and put it I on the Dungeon Master's Guild. <laughs> but I don't remember wear dinosaurs. I remember yeah. wear snakes and wear dragons and all kinds yeah. of different wear things. Wear bats. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But not wear dinosaurs. All right, so the Terra Folk, as they are uh, in 5th edition and in Chult, what are, they, what are they like now? So they are still big and they are still scary. Um, they're eight, nine feet tall with a, like a 20 foot wingspan. They gather in small little gangs, uh -huh. usually in high places, and they descend upon you and either rip you to pieces or steal all your stuff and take off back to their roosts. Uh, the Chultons call them terror, T-E-R-R-O-R -R -R folk, okay. because of this swoop in, attack you out of nowhere, tear you up, and then fly off. Uh, they're, they're sort of like aerial boogeymen. Yeah. Oh. Uh, to the Chultons. Right. Don't don't go out alone at night no. or the Terra Folk, terror will, get, folk will get you. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, that they're just one of the many, many, many things in Chult that can kill you out there when you're wandering around. So that's why people stay in Port yeah. and and places right. like that. Got it. Now, do they uh, have specific areas that they roam? Like, is it just wherever is near to home that they will attack you? They can, they can, they basically, they find roosts on any high area where they can get some vantage point and some line of sight, um, mountains or mesas and plateaus and things like that. Right. Uh, in Tomb of Annihilation, there's a gang of them atop this rocky spire called Firefinger. Mm. Um, it's called that because there's a huge gout of flame that erupts from the top, almost like a beacon. Oh. Uh, and they've sort of made that, hollowed it out with some caves and made that into their lair. And it gives them this sort of unparalleled view of the surrounding rivers and things like that and they can basically strike down from there and then fly back and your chances of getting up to them without some means of spider climbing or flying are pretty remote. Got it. Are they uh, um, intelligent? They are moderately intelligent. So um, like goblins level of intelligence? They're, I think they're just at or below the sort of bottom end of human intelligence. I see. Yeah, I mean, they're not a race of tool makers yeah. or anything like no. that. They don't no. build anything. They no. they just sort of steal stuff and, and feed and kill. Yeah. Is there any way to, to make allies of them? or Not really. No. Um, they're, they're pretty xenophobic and hateful mm -hmm. creatures and distrustful of anything other than them. So chances are if you encounter them, you're either going to have to beat them back or just kill them outright. Do they have a, uh, a rivalry with Aarakocra or vice versa? Yes, they don't like Aarakocra, at least not in the, the, the Tomb of Annihilation adventure. Those two races are at odds. I see. So you might at least get on one of the good sides if you uh, mm -hmm. were to deal with one or the other. Yes. And there's, uh, they also uh, prey or annoy other creatures as well. There's a, there's a figure who lives in this ghost village of Mambala. Mm. And if you meet her, she's got a Terra Folk problem. And she'll help you if you help her solve her Terra Folk problem. <laughs> I hate it when they have terra folk problems. Yeah. It's like, a real, it's a real problem. Um, so here's a question: If how many, if any, of the these would be uh, suitable for player races? Uh, the ones we've discussed, both the serial and the terra folk. I don't think that terra folk is a great candidate, just because they're so huge and cumbersome to, to use in your typical sort of D and D dungeon setting. Um, but I think any of the... You the wake up one morning, it's like, what happened to our halfling rogue? <laughs> and Sarah looks like, oh. I don't know, I just, it was really tasty. <laughs> yeah. But I think any of the sorials theoretically, I yeah. mean, they, ha they have been in the past. There yes. was uh, the complete book of humanoids, I think, that statted up 
them all for that in second edition. Yeah, there and was a Dragon Magazine article that, that also talked about Sorials in great detail and the idea being that you could play one. Yeah, and I think in third edition they, we did that again at some point, but I don't remember which product it we was We have in. not yet provided a fifth edition playable mm. Sorial race. Oh, and the... I should mention, uh, apparently, the sent communication of uh, Dragon Bait is um, not necessarily abnormal, but uh, distinctive because the other Sorials can talk. Oh, so. okay. So he just happened to be <laughs> mute and <laughs> adapted to yeah. use his scent as a, yeah. Yeah, as, a, as a means of communication. Okay. Well, well, lavender, sense. baked bread, honeysuckle, Honey s- I think. These were all different scents that he could yeah. exude that would yeah. then ham. mean different ham. things. Ham. Yes. Ham. ham was anger, I think, or was ham fear? Oh, I don't remember. <laughs> it's either fear or anger. That's a neat idea, ham though. It's to the dark side. <laughs> yeah. I like that with the, you know, like the Kukuri, you know, we have to, you know, you have to come up with new ways to role play them and uh, playing as a mute uh, <laughs> dinosaur <laughs> yeah. person that's sitting across the table like, ham, ham, ham. Yeah, right, it is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> is it cloved ham? Is it black forest ham? <laughs> different shades of anger. Different shades of anger or nice. fear. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you guys. That was a good uh, deep dive on that. Well, there's, uh, I'm sure we'll get more. Uh, there was dragon turtles we have to talk about. We might do that on, a, on a, an upcoming lore segment as well. Uh, but thank you. And uh, we'll get to it more this summer. All right. Thank you guys. All righty. Thank you for listening to us ch- uh, chat. I tried to get to as many questions as I could, but uh, the, thank you to the person who said put QUESTION in t- all caps at the beginning. Uh, it was definitely way easier to figure those out. So uh, uh, going forward, well, I'll say that at the top uh, for these lore segments. Um, and thank you guys for uh, being our guinea pigs for our first little uh, televised version of this. Coming up next, we have an interview with Suzanne Wallace, the brand manager for Roll20. is coming into the office with me and Shelly. We're going to talk to her next. Uh, so uh, stick around. Uh, we'll be back in about 10 minutes. Thanks.